The radio operators were sent on courses to learn how to use the new instrument. Although the assembly and the instrument itself were highly complicated, it was very simple to use. The outstanding feature of the Lee was the long antennae in the nose of the plane, which the pilots soon nicknamed the barbed wire. The field covered by these antennas was 30 degrees above and below and 60 degrees to port and starboard. The enemy aircraft was picked up by the apparatus at a distance corresponding to its own altitude. Thus, if the night fighter was flying at 13,000 feet, the wireless operator could see the enemy plane on his screen at a distance of 4,400 yards. Naturally, the machine itself was not visible, only the so-called zigzags. Since the distance alone would be of little use to the night fighter, Vertical and lateral zigzags appeared on two further screens, making three pictures in all. For the wireless operator, the handling of this apparatus, in addition to his other tasks, such as radio compass and fixed bearings, communication with the ground staff and over the RT, entailed an enormous amount of extra work. Moreover, the light blue flickering cathode ray tubes dazzled the eyes so much that the radio operator, after using the radar for half an hour, could no longer recognise the stars in a clear sky. Thus, the pilot and the gunner had to keep an even greater watch on their sector. The installation of this apparatus also demanded increased cooperation and mutual understanding between the fighter controller and the wireless operator. Previously, the pilot had been completely free to make his own decisions, but now he had to rely on the reports of his operator to follow the course according to the radar measurements. At the same time, the use of the Lee resulted in a complete change in night fighter tactics. The sectors were retained, but the direction of the fighters was now entrusted to high-ranking ground officers. The tactics were basically altered so that the night fighter was no longer led into a certain limited sector, but the entire ops group was assembled on the Channel Coast above a heavy transmitting beacon which lay on the known approach route of the enemy. The wing commanders agreed with their squadron commanders upon a secret frequency. The latter in turn got into communication with their crews. Thus, the CO could report to ground headquarters in a comparatively short time that his wing was ready to take off. In the most favourable conditions, the entire night fighter arm, graded at varying altitudes, circled above the beacon on the coast and was dispatched from there at short intervals against the oncoming bomber stream. One might say that the cards had been well shuffled and the Liechtenstein apparatus could begin to function. In addition to the Earth picture or Earth zigzag, which appeared constant on all three tubes and signified that the enemy machine was only the distance of their own altitude away, the radio operator, once directed into the bomber stream, could now pick up the enemy machines. Pictorially described, the electric beams of the radar explored the ether and reported to the operator in fractions of a second the altitude, distance and quarter of the enemy aircraft. If, for example, 800 bombers and 100 night fighters were in the stream, there was always the danger that instead of the opponent, the radar beam would pick up one of their own fighters flying ahead. But the inventor had foreseen this and added an additional gadget which made it possible to distinguish between friend and foe. With this new weapon, the night fighter could pursue his opponent from the channel to the target and back to the English coast, as long as he remained in the bomber stream and did not run out of fuel. The ground stations continually gave the position of the raiders, so that the night fighters always knew the air situation, and if necessary, could be directed into the bomber stream once more. Various airfields were notified and turned on their lights, as soon as a fighter got into trouble or ran out of juice. With the introduction of the Lee, an intensive battle was waged against the enemy in which every available night fighter took part. The migratory period had set in for the crews, and it was not unusual for pilots from France, Belgium, Germany or Denmark to meet on a Dutch airfield. In the grey light of dawn, they then proceeded back to their own airfields. One night, Fighter was so absorbed in his task that he followed the enemy bomber stream to England and, having run out of fuel, had to force land on a British airfield. For the Allies, the introduction of this new apparatus was almost a catastrophe. The goose step had suddenly become a death march. 
On 17th of November 1942, at about 23 Chasoni hours, there was great excitement among the crews at Venlo. The topic of the day was the Liechtenstein apparatus and the secret operation Adler. The division had given the order. Various squadrons of night fighters equipped with the new radar will take off in close formation against the enemy. Shortly before the start, the crews will be given the position of the enemy bomber stream and assemble over a beacon on the coast, flashing the code signal LI. From this point onwards, they will be introduced into the British bomber stream, which must be decimated before it reaches the target. Each crew is to pursue the enemy to the last drop of fuel. The orders were quite clear. Ober-Lieutenant Kanak and his wireless operator Hugh ran over once more all the details and the possibilities that might arise on this new mission. All the airfields were carefully marked on the map, for as yet no one knew which city the British would attack that night. It might be Kiel, or again, it might be Frankfurt am Main. There was a feverish discussion as to the possibilities of success. Not a single machine will get back to England one of them maintained. This was obviously an exaggeration, but everyone felt there was something in the air. After their insignificant successes on recent operations and the terrible destruction of the German cities, it was the obvious duty of the crews to make the most of this new invention. At 23.20 hours, the coastal ground stations reported the start of strong bomber formations from the Midlands. Readiness for all 30 serviceable machines and crews. One operator reported that his Lee was not working. A special radio car hastened over to the aircraft and checked the complicated mechanism. The fault was soon found, and the machine was declared ready for operations. At 23.45 hours, the loudspeaker reported, The British bomber formations are assembling in Map Square 23. Longitude 2 degrees 20 minutes. Latitude 54 degrees 32 minutes. Strength of the formation. Circa 600 aircraft. Altitude 15,000 feet. All aircraft proceed to Beacon LI at Scheveningen on the Channel Coast. 23.46 hours. Ober Lieutenant Kanaka was the first to take off. He turned onto course 200 without making a circuit round the field. He switched off his navigating lights and his machine was swallowed up in the darkness. A clear, starry sky lay over Holland. Ideal weather for night fighters. Naka did not spare his aircraft and rose at 18 feet per second to the prescribed altitude. Unteroffizier Ho called his squadron mates on the intercom. Buzzard 5 from Buzzard 1, come in. Buzzard 1 from Buzzard 5. Victor, message received, am on course, 200. One after the other, the planes reported. Kanak called up the CO and received a reply. Hauptmann Streeb ordered complete radio silence to prevent the British having any suspicions of their presence. The ground station reported three other night fighter wings in the air. Year 0 0.10 hours. Order to attack. All aircraft fly on course 180. The leading bombers are flying over the coast west of Rotterdam on course 90. Probable objective, the Ruhr... Enemy altitude 16,500 feet. Oberlieutenant Kanaka turned on his radar, set his course at 180 and came down to 16,500 feet. Within five minutes he would meet the leading bombers. The first real test of the new radar eye had begun. Unter Offizier Ho eagerly watched the pictures on the cathode ray tubes. At the outset, only the ground zigzag appeared, giving a regular jagged line on the lower screen of the tube. Tension rose. For six minutes, flying time had already elapsed. Then the miracle occurred. From starboard to port, a fine jagged line travelled above the ground picture into the side cathode ray tube, the enemy. Hugh was wild with excitement. He immediately gave his pilot a change of course to 90 Dintida. And behold, as the machine turned, the enemy line retreated from starboard to port and remained in the centre of the tube. The bomber was therefore directly ahead. The distance tube showed 4,000 yards and the altitude tube 16,350 feet. 
Knacker could not believe that the Britisher was already pinpointed at this great distance. He peered out in the direction of his opponent but could not see him, for the vision of the human in the dark is not more than a hundred to two hundred yards. His nerves were at breaking point. Would the Tommy be able to break out of his radar field? No, for the crews were still flying calmly towards the defence zone and would only be at action stations once the first searchlight was turned on. The pilot was taking no avoiding action. Knocker gave full throttle. The distance decreased from 4,000 to 3,500 to 3,000 and to 2,500 yards. Suddenly, Hugh reported a new contact at 2,000 yards distance. A British machine had crossed their field slowly, from north to south. For a moment, Knack was uncertain which opponent to pursue. Then he decided upon the nearest bomber. The big enemy zigzags showed up wonderfully in the tubes. The machine had begun to weave and was now travelling on the screen alternately from port to starboard and back. Could the crew have noticed anything? That was impossible. The distance decreased to 500 and to 300 yards. Cautiously, Naka throttled down and looked out on all sides. Hugh gave him the final Lee readings. Opponent 200 yards ahead, 50 feet above us. Then he could no longer endure the light in the apparatus. But the Britisher was still invisible to the human eye. Three pairs of eyes scanned the sky for his shadow. The situation was not without its dangers. There were always the dangers of a collision or of being spotted first. Nucka grew nervous since he still could not see the enemy. Though looked once more in his apparatus, the zigzags were now gigantic on the distance screen. The bomber must now be very close to the pursuing night fighter. Nucka gave a start. Straight ahead and a little above him, he had caught sight of the barely visible shadow of a four-engine bomber. Now he must take care. The Britisher had not spotted him. The mighty shark's fins on the tail unit were clearly outlined against the night sky. A short sterling, she carried eight to ten tons of explosives in her bomb bays ready to drop on the Ruhr. Kanak did not hesitate for a second, but waded in. Bright flames spurted from the engines and tanks. A second burst tore open the fuselage and probably killed the crew. In the ghostly light he could see the red, white and blue circles on the body of the aircraft just before it plunged with its bomb load into the depths. This kill had the effect of a nightmare beam upon his fellow pilots now attacking the bomber stream. The plane exploded with a bright scarlet flash in the harbour of Rotterdam. And now a terrifying half-hour began for the enemy. Everywhere in the sky could be seen the flash of tracers from heavy machine guns and cannon. Three, four, five enemy bombers hurtled on fire earthwards. The path of their flight from Rotterdam to the Ruhr was strewn with blazing wrecks. The Lee machine had proved itself to be a precision instrument. Within half an hour, Kanak had shot down four bombers. Then he had a terrifying experience. Ho reported a contact at 2,000 yards. Kanak attacked at full speed. He caught up his opponent and, in the darkness, suddenly caught sight of the British rear gunner's perspex cockpit. In his excitement, Kanaka fired immediately into the full petrol tanks. The British rear gunner lost his head, left his machine guns and bailed out, landing right in the propeller of the pursuing night fighter. There was a dull thud which made Kanaka's plane shudder. The engine began to vibrate so badly that he had to cut it out. He landed his clumsy Messerschmitt 110 at Venlo on one engine. Mechanics rushed over and lit up the machine. By the light of their torches, they could still see traces of blood and hair on the propeller. Strips of uniform were hanging on the antennae of the Lee. The fate of the British gunner upset everyone. Over a hundred bombers lay that night as wrecks on Dutch soil. The invisible Lee rays had broken up a mass attack on the Ruhr that night, and had been disastrous to the British crews. Obituary Oberlieutenant Reinhold Knacker, the ace of Night Fighter Wing No. 1, was born in Strelitz on 1st of January 1919. The young squadron leader shot down 43 of the enemy by night in bitter air combats over Holland. His successes were several times reported in the Wehrmacht communique. But the operations eventually began to fray his nerves. 
Kanaka felt this and led an incredibly ascetic life. He neither drank nor smoked, and in the rest, periods kept fit by playing games with his fellow pilots. One February night in 1943, the fate of this modest, conscientious flying officer was sealed. His CO had just recommended him for the oak leaves to the Knight's Cross, but the decoration was awarded to him posthumously. After a bitter fight with a four-engine Halifax, the enemy bomber and the night fighter plunged together into the depths. The British rear gunner opened fire at exactly the same moment as Knack, and the bursts on both sides were fatal. In the early morning, the troops found the crews and debris of both machines lying next to each other in a field. The calm before the storm, during this successful period with the new radar apparatus against the RAF. I was posted in December 1942 with No. 3 Squadron of Night Fighter Wing No. 1 to Pachim. This order came as a complete surprise, for during my 18 months with this wing I had grown very attached to it. The squadron's successes and the tough times we had experienced together, as well as the moments of triumph, had forged strong bonds between the pilots. Parshim is in Mecklenburg, and so far had been left unscathed by the war. The landscape and the inhabitants radiated peace and contentment. After the exciting ops in Holland, I felt as though I had been sent on permanent leave. The Parshim CO was obviously delighted to see us arrive. The full sheds were cleared of the old training machines and now served to house brand new night fighter types which had just arrived from Gotha. The extremely well-equipped workshop was adapted to service our Messerschmitts. The entire airfield installations were renovated to deal with night fighter activities. By Christmas 1942, the wing was fully equipped and at full complement. The backbone of number three. Night Fighter Wing No. 6 was the veteran operational squadron from Venlo. The officer commanding this new Night Fighter Wing was Hauptmann Schönert, an officer of experience. Nearly all the crews were fresh from training school. We flew every night and no time was lost, for even the younger pilots realised why they were in Parshim to protect the German capital from the coming terror raids. Most of the boys from the flying schools were magnificent airmen, Flying was in their blood. Hauptmann Schönert realised his luck in being able to prepare his crews for operations in peace and quiet, without enemy interference. What would have happened to these young pilots had they been flung immediately into action as soon as they left school? The answer had already been seen in the West. Night after night, the youngsters did not return while the veterans continued to pile up their victories and yet the rookies in Parchim did not realise how lucky they were. On the contrary, they cursed this godforsaken hole and the boring peacetime conditions. Hauptmann Schönert used to say, It is a fine thing to die a hero's death, but you are far more used to your country as a pilot. In the West, the battle between the armies continued with undiminished vigour. In May 1943, a message came from the division. The West needs reinforcements. Since in the short summer nights only attacks on the Ruhr could be envisaged, fighter corps assembled the experienced crews on the Dutch and Belgian airfields. I, too, was posted to the west. My crew was delighted. The fellows who remained behind were very depressed when they said goodbye to us. Our crates were stuffed to bursting point with everything the airman needs when he is posted. Wireless set, a dog, washing and toilet utensils, schnapps cupboard, and a good many other things. Space was cramped in the aircraft. The radio operator and gunner sat huddled together in the rear cockpit. Our Messerschmitt 110 looked more like a furniture van than a streamlined night fighter. Hedgehopping over the airfield, we dipped our wings in farewell to those who remained behind and set our course westwards. At dusk, about 1933 hours, I landed on the big airfield of Gilze, near Breda, and reported to the CO, Hauptmann Frank, an old friend from my Venlo days. It was a pleasant reunion. Among my new mates were the successful long-distance night fighters, Lieutenant Heinz Strunning, Busmann and Oberfeldwebel Gildner. Strunning, with Cologne wit, told me of his experiences as a night fighter over England. 
In 1941 and 1942, these courageous pilots hovered over English airfields and shot down the bombers just as they came into land. Uncle Heine, as we called him because he was older than ourselves, relived his adventures as he told them to us. Boys, he said, jestingly, there were so many Tommies circling the airfield that we could have knocked them out of the skies with our caps. One evening in July 1943, we were all in our bomb-proof dugout, waiting for operations. Strunning entered and burst out, Boys, have I had a laugh? A real blue-blooded aristocrat blew in today, but let me sit down. Suddenly we heard the faint drone of engines, which increased in strength until they were directly overhead. A loud hiss, and we all lay flat on the floor. Bombs. The light flickered and went out. Crump. The next stick was quite close. By rights we should have jumped into the trench, but no one gave it a thought. In the dugout we were protected from splinters, and why should the bombs fall directly on the roof? Uncle Heine lit a candle and went on with his story. I was sitting with Hauptmann Frank this afternoon when a tall, thin captain strolled in. Good morning, Frank, he said with a drawl. I'm Wittgenstein, and I've been posted to your squadron. What's cooking? Where is there something to shoot down? He's in a hurry, I thought to myself. At the same moment he introduced himself to me. Ah, my friend, said our O.C., rather bewildered. I suppose you're Prince Wittgenstein, the former bomber pilot. Quite right, my dear Frank. But drop the prince, just call me Wittgenstein. Have my machine put near control so that I can take off at once. A madman, I thought, as I took my leave. Once outside, I got into conversation with the prince's crew. Among other things, they told me that their princely coachman had recently made his radio operator stand to attention in the plane and confined him to his quarters for three days, because he had lost the picture in his screen during a mission. Since he shot down three bombers shortly afterwards, he pardoned the man and awarded him the Iron Cross First Class. All this took place at 15,000 feet, right in the middle of the English bomber stream. There's no holding the prince once he's in the air, they said. He takes off like a maniac and only lands when he hasn't a drop of juice left. The following day I had the pleasure of flying with him in Beaver Sector. When we met over the beacon, he sent me the following message. You stick here by the beacon. I'm off hunting. Since he was a captain and I was only a lieutenant, I could not disobey, but I went off hunting all the same. Obituary. Heinrich Prinz zu Sein Wittgenstein was one of the most successful night fighter pilots, and his name was bracketed with those of Major Strybe and Lent. But the ambition of this eager and outstanding airman was to be head of the night fighter elite. Spurred on by his need for action, the young group commander shot down 84 enemy bombers in tough air battles, but his 84th victory, actually his fifth kill on the night of 21st January 1944, led him not to his coveted position, but to his death. Directly after his fifth victory that night, he was attacked and shot down by a British night fighter. The prince gave orders to his crew to bail out and tried to save his aircraft. He failed, recognising the danger too late. He bailed out just before the burning machine crashed. On the following day, his body was found near the wreckage. Major Heinrich Prince zu Sein Wittgenstein born on 14th August 1916 in Copenhagen, decorated with the oak leaves and swords to the Knight's Cross, will be remembered by all night fighter pilots as a courageous and exemplary airman. A warm, mild breeze blew through the musty barracks and attracted us outside. Engines were being revved up at the far end of the airfield. Ha ha, said Uncle Heine. Those are our remaining bombers which have not yet been destroyed on the ground. The poor crews are now off to England. I recently had a chat with one of their NCO pilots. They're really to be pitied. In the old days they set out in armadas of between 400 and 600 aircraft, and today there are only about 100 of them left. Moreover, those old crates are out of date and an easy prey for the British night fighters. If 30 of them set out tonight, probably only 20 would return. Our proud bomber formations in the west had sunk lamentably. Some of them were sent to the eastern front, 
and the rest were decimated night after night without receiving sufficient reinforcements. The Allies had won air supremacy, not only over the British Isles, but also over German territory. Even the simple soldier now began to reflect upon the failure of the Luftwaffe. His incipient doubts, however, were still stifled by skilful propaganda. The high-ranking Nazi officers gave lectures on the new V1 and V2 weapons. There is no further need now, they insisted, for us to fly to England. We shall soon bring the British to their knees with our V1. Until then, the German soldier must stick it out and do his best to protect the fatherland from further losses. Long live the Führer. Always the same words. Stick it out, stick it out. The night fighter squadrons really gave of their best. From the group captains to the youngest corporal pilots, they took off night after night against the enemy. The ground staff taxed themselves to the limit to get all the machines serviceable before nightfall. But in the machine age, all effort and sacrifices on the part of the squadrons are of no avail when they lag behind the enemy in technical progress. What we needed were faster and better day fighters, bombers or night fighters. Was it not a disgrace to our leaders that the Tommy could fly longer and at a greater speed over the Reich than our own fighters? In 1940, our Messerschmitt 109s and Fokkerwolfs fought on even terms with the Hurricanes and Spitfires. But how was it now, in 1943? They still took off in the same Messerschmitt 109s and Fokkerwolfs, although in improved types against faster enemy machines such as Thunderbolts, Mustangs, Mosquitoes and Lightnings. The Allies now used their Hurricanes and Spits as training machines. We asked ourselves daily why the Luftwaffe was not equipped with turbojets, the plans of which already lay in Professor Messerschmitt's locker in 1941. Were they going to delay until it was perhaps too late? These were our gloomy thoughts as we sat waiting for the next night ops. The British had hardly started than we received the order. Readiness for all machines. The Tommy was airborne. 0050 hours. Orders to take off. I flew on a direct course to Shawen Island and climbed to 15,000 feet. Beaver headquarters reported the first radar contacts. Eero 1, Zara hours. My radio operator, Facius, reported a Tommy 1,000 yards away flying due west, full throttle. The enemy machine swiftly approached. We were now directly over the coast. The sea glittered pale in the moonlight and the land lay in complete darkness. My Messerschmitt 110 was caught in the first propeller slipstreams. Now I had to keep my eyes skinned. Facius gave the latest reports. Enemy 50 yards ahead at our altitude. Within a matter of seconds, I saw the glowing exhaust pipes, eight of them. Ah, a four-engine bomber. I did a shallow dive until I was 150 feet below the Tommy. Facius had already recognised the type of Halifax. I attacked and hit the left wing with my first burst. The flames spurted from the tanks, and I could clearly see red, white and blue circles. The burning bomber hurtled like a comet down to earth, and the hunt went on. Oro won 43 hours, another picture on our screen. Facius did a good job. Slowly we stalked the opponent, 1,000 yards, 600, 200, 100, and I could already see the dark shadow. Another Halifax. A minute later, this bomber too had been dispatched on fire. Silence then reigned over the air. A few moments later, Beaver headquarters reported a heavy attack on Cologne. The dispersed British squadrons met over Cologne. I received orders from the ground station to circle over the Beaver beacon and wait for their return flight. In the far distance on the west horizon, we could see a bright glow in the sky. The bombs were falling on the cathedral city. Beaver soon reported the first returning bombers. Long before they reached the coast, the British lost height in order to cross the channel at a greater speed and reach the haven of their own coast. Falcon 10 from Beaver, come in. I gave my altitude and course. Falcon 10, fly on course 280. Enemy aircraft at 9,000 feet, couriers losing height. I reacted at once and set off in pursuit. The distance was still 6,000 yards. I dived steeply and gave more throttle. 
Fatius set the aerial arms of the Lee in action, exploring the air around him. Suddenly jagged lines appeared on the screen. Beaver reported, Enemy flying at full speed for the coast. Give her full throttle. Do you think he'll get away? asked my radio operator. No, he mustn't get away, I replied. The engines roared and my speed rose to 310 miles per hour. Slowly we caught up with the enemy. He's turned, reported Facius. The jagged lines on the cathode ray tubes kept swinging from port to starboard and back. We were already over the sea at 6,000 feet. I gambled everything on one card and set the throttle at full power. At this stress, the engines would only last for a bare five minutes. Fascia stopped his watch. My plane bucked and shuddered. The vibrations and the rough running of the engines were communicated to the crew. Those were the moments of greatest tension. At any moment one could reckon with a disaster. Facius reported calmly, We're closing in fast, enemy 1,000 yards ahead. Now one of us had only ten minutes more to live, for there was no chance of rescue over the sea. One of us must go down, for that was the law of warfare. Six hundred yards now, reported Facius, enemy flying on the same course and losing height. A swift glance at my altimeter. It showed 3,600 feet. We were at a ticklish height. It was only a matter of seconds when one had to bail out of a burning machine. The parachute needed time to open. The May West had to be blown up before bailing out, or else it sank like a lump of lead. Distance 400 yards. Well, no use thinking about it. Bright moonlight astern favoured the Tommy. He had the greatest chance of spotting us first. For this reason, I took up my position on his quarter so as not to receive a full blast from the rear gunner's armaments. Facius reported, Distance 150 yards, altitude 2,400 feet, enemy dead ahead. And there he was. The bomber's shark fins gleamed in the bright moonlight. At the same moment, the Tommy had spotted me and banked savagely to port. The life and death struggle began. Hardly was I in firing position than the bomber zoomed. His wing surfaces grew enormous, as though appealing for help to the dark night sky. But I kept on his tail. As he zoomed, the enemy's fuselage came fully into my sights. I fired, but in a flash, he recognised the danger and went into a steep dive. The sweat was pouring down my cheeks. My altimeter showed only 900 feet. The British pilot pulled out just above the water at the very last moment. Now he was too low to dive again. The pilot weaved like a maniac to disturb my aim. The crew were firing madly with all their guns and the tracers framed my machine. Now it was a question of keeping a cool head. I dived right down to the water. As a result of this manoeuvre, the Tommy probably lost sight of me. For a moment he flew on an even keel, then I zoomed and pressed the button of my cannon and machine guns. A giant blue flame spurted from the port petrol tank and the bomber crashed with its crew into the sea. My crew breathed with relief. They had lived through these anxious moments without being able to do anything. No one said a word as we circled above the scene of the crash. A bright red gurgle of water and once more darkness and silence. Slowly I climbed to 3,000 feet and flew in the direction of the Dutch coast. Facius called Beaver headquarters, but they did not hear us for our fight had carried us too far out to sea. After this third victory, I was all in. Only one idea remained in my head. To get home, to land, and to sleep. At last, Beaver replied. Beaver from Falcon 10, I called. Third kill. A Vickers Wellington shot down over the sea in Map Square, IG-33. On my way home, at 0247 hours I touched down on the Flaripat at Gilserain. I hardly heard the congratulations of my fellow pilots. In the huts I met Heinz Strunning. My god Jonin, he said, I was over Cologne. It was a gruesome sight. The whole city was a sea of flames. Let's hope my wife and children are still alive. If things go on like this, we shall soon be in a real mess. This was the first time I had seen our cheerful Heine look serious. We wandered slowly back to our huts. The night wind cooled our heated foreheads. Good night, Heine. Off again tomorrow, I suppose. Night 
he replied, but I hope it won't be over Cologne. By a lucky coincidence, I landed once more at my old station, Venlo. What a change I found in Night Fighter Wing number one. My former CO, Major Stribe, was delighted to see me. Very few of his trusty veterans were still alive. The men with experience had been dispersed in all directions and formed the backbone of the night fighter wings from Paris to Flensburg. New faces greeted me, the once chivalrous combat waged by the night fighters, which spoke well for the fair disciplined training of the airmen under the pressure of the terrible losses inflicted on the civilian population by round-the-clock bombing, had developed into a ruthless warfare in which no quarter was given. The pilots' faces had grown hard and no trace of youthfulness remained. Major Strebe, the most successful night fighter wing commander, had now shot down 66 enemy bombers and had been awarded the oak leaves with swords to his knight's cross. The previous night, within a short time, he had managed to increase his score by five thanks to our new night fighter plane, the Heinkel HE-219. Later he met with an accident on landing. This Heinkel type, originally developed thanks to the energy of General Cam Huber in cooperation between Night Fighter Command, troops and industry, still had teething troubles. Although the pilot's demands for high speed, powerful armament, good range and visibility had been fulfilled, this prototype developed faults in design. At high speeds, the tail unit began to wobble. The fuselage had been lengthened to overcome this. Strebe flew this machine from its seventh test flight onwards. On the previous night, the Heinkel He-219 had been in action for the first time. Five bombers were brought down. But on landing, although the machine had not been hit, various instruments were put out of action. The wing flaps also failed to function. They could be lowered to landing position, but immediately rose to normal flight. Strebe, therefore, was obliged to land at a very great speed. When the machine touched down with a bump on the concrete runway, the starboard engine broke away from the wing. There was a deafening report, the Heinkel He-219. Literally broke in pieces, wings and fuselage collapsed, the Perspex cockpit came away from the body, and whirled with the pilot fifty yards through the air. Fortunately, Strebe was uninjured. The fire engine and ambulance men hurried up to free his radio operator, Unteroffizier Fischer, from the wreckage. By some miracle, he too was unhurt. The pair of them were astonishingly lucky. The Tinfoil Enemy On 27th of July 1943, there was something in the air, the early warnings from the Freya apparatus on the Channel coast indicated a large-scale British raid. In the late afternoon, various flak units, night fighter wings and civilian air raid posts had been given orders to have their full complement at action stations. What were the British up to? What city that night would be the victim of these well-prepared raids? Every ominous presentiment was to be fulfilled that night. In all ignorance, the night fighter squadrons took off against the British bombers, whose leaders were reported over northern Holland. I was on ops and flew in the direction of Amsterdam. On board, everything was in good order and the crew was in a cheerful mood. Radio operator Fatius made a final check and reported that he was all set. The ground stations kept calling the night fighters, giving them the positions of the bombers. That night, however, I felt that the reports were being given hastily and nervously. It was obvious no one knew exactly where the enemy was or what his objective would be. An early recognition of the direction was essential so that the night fighters could be introduced as early as possible into the bomber stream. But the radio reports kept contradicting themselves. Now the enemy was over Amsterdam and then suddenly west of Brussels and a moment later they were reported far out to sea in Map Square 25. What was to be done? The uncertainty of the ground stations was communicated to the crews. Since this game of hide-and-seek went on for some time, I thought, to hell with them all, and flew straight to Amsterdam. By the time I arrived over the capital, the air position was still in a complete muddle. No one knew where the British were, but all the pilots were reporting pictures on their screens. I was no exception. 
At 15,000 feet, my sparker announced the first enemy machine in his lie. I was delighted. I swung round onto the bearing in the direction of the Ruhr, for in this way I was bound to approach the stream. Farsius proceeded to report three or four pictures on his screens. I hoped that I should have enough ammunition to deal with them. Then Facius suddenly shouted, Tommy flying towards us at a great speed, distance decreasing 2,000 yards, 1,500, 1,000, 500. I was speechless. Facius already had a new target. Perhaps it was a German night fighter on a westerly course, I said to myself, and made for the next bomber. It was not long before Fasius shouted again, Bomber coming for us at a hell of a speed. Two thousand, one thousand, five hundred. He's gone. You're crackers, Fasius, I said jestingly. But I soon lost my sense of humour for this crazy performance was repeated a score of times, and finally I gave Fasius such a rocket that he was deeply offended. This tense atmosphere on board was suddenly interrupted by a ground station calling Hamburg, Hamburg, a thousand enemy bombers over Hamburg, calling all night fighters, calling all night fighters, full speed for Hamburg. I was speechless with rage. For half an hour I had been weaving about in a presumed bomber stream, and the bombs were already falling on Germany's great port. It was a long way to Hamburg. The Zuida Zee, the Ems and the Weser disappeared below us, and Hamburg appeared in the distance. The city was blazing like a furnace. It was a horrifying sight. On my arrival over the city, the ground station was already reporting the homeward flight of the enemy in the direction of Heligoland. Too late. The flak gunners had already ceased to fire, and the gruesome work of destruction had been accomplished. In low spirits, we flew back to our airfield. How could the German defences have been rendered so impotent? We know today. The British had procured an example of our successful Lee apparatus and had found the countermeasure. With ridiculous strips of tinfoil, they could now lure the entire German night fighter arm onto false trails and reach their own target unmolested. It was a simple yet brilliant idea. As is well known, radar works on a determined ultra short wave frequency. By dropping these strips of tinfoil, the British jammed this frequency. In this way, the air goal was achieved, and for the night fighter, the bomber had once more become as invisible as it had been before the invention of the Liechtenstein apparatus. While the main bomber stream far out to sea was flying towards Hamburg, smaller formations had flown over Holland and Belgium to western Germany, dropping millions of tinfoil strips. These laminetta appeared on the German screens as enemy bombers and put various ground stations out of action. The smaller formations, according to schedule, next dropped enormous quantities of flares, the famous Christmas trees over various cities in the Ruhr. A few bombs were also dropped. The night fighters streaked towards these signs of attack from all directions, looking in vain for the bomber stream. In the meantime, the leaders of the British main raiding force had reached Heligo land unhindered and dropped more strips, putting the ground detectors out of action. At one blow, both ground and air defence had been paralysed. In daylight on the following morning, whole areas of Holland, Belgium and northern Germany were strewn with these strips of foil. Certain people maintained that they were poisonous and that they would kill the cattle. The innocuousness of these small pieces of tinfoil on the ground was soon apparent, but in the air they were deadly fatal for the life of a whole city. A few days later we heard further details of the agony of this badly hit city. The raging fires in a high wind caused terrific damage, and the grievous loss of human life outstripped any previous raids. All attempts to extinguish them proved fruitless and technically impossible. The fires spread unhindered, causing fiery storms which reached heats of 1,000 degree and speeds approaching gale force. The narrow streets of Hamburg, with their countless backyards, were favourable to the flames, and there was no escape. As a result of the dense carpet bombing, large areas of the city had been transformed into a single sea of flame within half an hour. Thousands of small fires joined up to become a giant conflagration. 
The fiery wind tore the roofs from the houses, uprooted large trees and flung them into the air like blazing torches. The inhabitants took refuge in the air raid shelters, in which later they were burnt to death or suffocated. In the early morning, thousands of blackened corpses could be seen in the burnt-out streets. In Hamburg, one thought was uppermost in every mind to leave the city and to abandon the battlefield. During the following nights, until 3 August 1943, the British returned and dropped on the almost defenceless city about 3,000 blockbusters, 1,200 landmines, 25,000 he, 3,000 thousand hours incendiaries, 8,000 phosphorus bombs and 500 phosphorus drums. 4,000 men were killed, a further 4,000 wounded and 9,000 Mazalauers were homeless or missing. This devastating raid on Hamburg had the effect of a red light on all the big German cities and on the whole German people. Everyone felt it was now high time to capitulate before any further damage was done. But the High Command insisted that the total war should proceed. Hamburg was merely the first link in a long chain of pitiless air attacks made by the Allies on the German civilian population. Shortly after our return from the West to Parchim, we had a little celebration where the drink flowed freely. A fellow pilot from Essen, Peter Spoden, who was very popular in the mess, had to keep going down to the cellar. The old man, Hauptmann Schönert, was on free and easy terms with the whole mess. He remembered his own youth and spoke enthusiastically of his life as a sailor. During a lull in the party, he suddenly stood up, grabbed one of us by the shoulders and dragged him to the window. The last rays of the evening sun were breaking over the cloud banks on the horizon and staining the heavens scarlet. The sky was a riot of colour, from the most delicate blue to fiery red on the rising cloud bank. The evening had fallen and deep peace lay over the land. The CO opened the window to let in the cool air. The pine woods were fragrant. He puffed his cigar with relish and turned to us with a smile. Boys, you've bitten off a pretty hard chunk. You get into your crates and are swallowed up in the darkness. Some of you return from single combats at thousands of feet above the tortured, burning earth. Each of you flings his life without a murmur into the scales, a bloody hard life. At the age of twenty, I lived a carefree, happy one. I sailed the seven seas as a ship's boy and learnt to appreciate and love other nations. You could find good pals everywhere. We were all flung together in our cargo boats, Britishers, Norwegians, Danes and Germans. At first, the atmosphere was very cold, but once we had the first storm behind us, we smiled at each other. During the first days at sea, it was each man for himself, and yet as soon as we began to feel homesick, we grew closer to each other. Soon we were pals and brothers, to hell with all prejudices. Here in the howling storm, when the huge breakers washed the decks and Father Death stood in the bows, was to be found the real League of Nations. We laughed at the raging seas, and this laugh meant confidence and mutual aid in life and death. When the gale blew itself out, we had a breathing space and we had been granted a new lease of life. On reaching our home port after many months, we had become a community which recognised no difference of people, race or speech. With heavy hearts, we said farewell, in the hope that we should never forget comrades who had shared our joys and griefs. I have found the same comradeship among you. We too are faced with the same dangers, and yet there's something eating me. There was a bitter look on his face as he said these words. We are destroying ourselves. Our fight is not against the powers of nature for the good of humanity, but an attempt to destroy life with all the new weapons of science. Do not men of our race, perhaps the fair-haired Britishers with whom I sailed in the Bay of Biscay and made friends sit in their bombers night after night, turning our cities to ruins? Each does his duty, but don't we thereby aggravate our hatred? At night we see only the enemy bomber and its bright red, white and blue circles. Our cities burn. The bomber must be brought down at all costs, and when it crashes, we crow. We only see the bomber burning and not the crew. We only see the emblem laid low, not the youngsters hanging on their straps in their death agony. 
And then perhaps one day you meet a Tommy who has bailed out. You meet him down below. His eyes have lost the harsh glint of battle. You shake hands, and this handshake is the beginning of a comradeship, born of a life and death struggle. Gratefully, he accepts the cigarette you offer. The barrier that divided us has fallen, and two men stand facing each other. Hostility and propaganda have made them enemies, but the common danger of battle has made them friends. Just as here, in a small way, hatred is changed to friendship, may the racial hatred also tum to friendship. But the iron carapace in which the nations shroud themselves, the outward symbols of which are emblems and threats, must be swept away. For the more the modern world uses science, the bloodier will the battles become. The more man takes refuge behind armour plating and steel, the greater will be his will to destruction. For this reason, this bloody murder must come to an end. The people must lay aside their blood-stained armour unless the whole world is to be destroyed. All the people of the world could live in peace, and this path must be taken together and protected, so that they could all rise in judgment against anyone who left the path. Hauptmann Schoenert looked up at the darkening sky. Short indeed were these hours of relaxation for the menace of the British hung like a sword of Damocles over the German cities. They were trying to destroy the heart of Germany from the air. All of us were living under the spell of the approaching catastrophe. This rest period had to be used for training the newcomers. Night after night we flew, practiced and trained, until the recruits could handle their machines with the precision of a sleepwalker.